Welcome back to Goldmark TV. We're here for the opening of a wonderful new show of works by Jenny Gravatt, celebrating 50 years as a working artist. Uh, we're very lucky to have Jenny here with us today to talk through this wonderful show. We've got some beautiful pictures on the walls, so I hope you enjoy this, this enlightening interview. Jenny, uh, welcome to the gallery. Thank lovely you. To see you. Lovely to be here. We're very lucky to have your, your pictures here and to be showing this wonderful exhibition, but it didn't start for you with Goldmark, did it? No, no. I, well, I have been painting for 50 years, but the first nine or ten were very hard slog and I didn't have a proper gallery, so I took myself off down to London and I thought, well, I'll start at the top. So I walked into Browse and Derby's, not really, really realising how cheeky that was. Um, and Lillian Browse herself happened to be there, which she hardly ever was, and took time to look at my work and said some of mine looked like William Nicholson's, who I didn't know either, went off to fetch a book about him, only to find that she had written the book. There she was, the author, and I thought this lady's obviously quite something. And she said then and there, I don't very often accept people who walk through the door, but I, I like these. And if you go back and fetch this one and this one, I'll put them in the summer exhibition. Oh, wonderful. So what an opportunity. Of course, they weren't in frames and she wanted them within four days. So that was a task in itself. But I whizzed back to Leicestershire and on the train and we got the framing done super quick. And they went up in the summer exhibition and by some miracle, both of them sold. And then there was a, another opportunity came up. She had an artist let her down and she had a show in January and no artist to fill it. Could I possibly, in November this was, produce 30 paintings? Would, oh, I would have them, wouldn't I? And I said, oh yes, yes, of course, yes. Okay. <laughs> I had about 20. And I had to work so hard from November to January to produce the other 10. I even worked on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. That was my very good fortune to have a show with Lillian in Browse and Derby's and it turned my life around. And they were my representing gallery then for another 11 years until she retired, officially retired. Um, and then she was, remained an absolutely magnificent friend and mentor and Right up until her death, I used to go and visit her, and she was a lovely lady, yes. A huge figure in, a, in, a, in an often male-dominated world as well. Very it? much a male-dominated world. I mean, her life story is, well, she has written about it. There is an autobiography. And she, during the war years, contacted, first of all, Winston Churchill to see if he would show some work in the then empty National Gallery. And he agreed, and of course after that, everybody else she asked agreed, and she would put these exhibitions on throughout the war of loaned pictures from eminent collections. And after the war, having done that, she founded the Bra Roland Browse and Elbanco Gallery on Cork Street with two chaps. And that was just phenomenal in those days, you know, to be doing that kind of thing. And she was trained as a ballet dancer. You know, she, <laughs> she didn't even have the background, but... Um, she thought she knew what she was doing and she had this wonderful confidence and charm. Yes, she was an amazing lady. I remember you telling me that at the time you were making a lot of still lifes, still a wonderful part of your work today. Um, but back then they were quite handy because you were looking after your, your yes. two children. Yes, she admired my still lives and that really was about all I was able to do because I had small children and sometimes it was just three hours in a day that I had in the studio and I could do a still life in that time, as long as it was small enough. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it was often things lined up on the kitchen windowsill or whatever was to hand. But she did love that and she appreciated it. And some of her favorite artists were artists of still life. Mm. So that was very good for me. Mm. Looking mm. around this show, there is life everywhere. There's wonderful pictures of apple blossoms and, and trees and forests. When did that, that interest in, in the landscape around you first, first come in? Yes, uh, that was when we moved to Keeper's Cottage, which is um, 27 years ago now. And I was surrounded by landscape and I'd had a bit of a hang up about it actually, because Lillian 
whenever I showed her my paintings, she would always say the still lives were the best. Mm. So I thought, well, I've got to get over this hang up. I'm now surrounded by landscape. I think I ought to get down to it. And, and that's when I started. And because it's mainly trees, it's parkland, and I could literally see them from the bottom of my own garden and wander around. And, and I started to become much more familiar with it. And confidence comes from familiarity, I think. So that's when it really started. And obviously, I've ventured a lot further afield now. And I do a lot of walking in the local area, which is the Charnwood Forest area. And I know the woodlands there and the um, open spaces of Bradgate Park, that, full of these ancient oak trees. They're just so inspiring. And actually, I don't know many professional artists who've tackled that. You know, it is, I feel it's my own little world to go out and I really enjoy it and the change of the seasons it's just ever changing I actually look forward to winter because I love the frosty colors it's a complete change of palette from the bright strong summer colors and of course autumn's coming along and I love all those curry paste yellows and yeah we've seen also some uh, some reverses in that wonderful palette and some fantastic in fact one just over your shoulder beautiful uh, moonlit forest. There's a number yes. of moon paintings in this exhibition. Yes. Um, a completely different feel, it feels like, uh, from you. Can you tell me a little bit more about, about well, those Well, that paintings? came about um, mainly because I had a lot of also rands, paintings that didn't come up to scratch, and piled up on a shelf. And I had been watching the moon and enjoying the moon. It was in November. And we drove back some, from some friends one night and the whole way home, because I wasn't driving, I just watched the moon and I thought there must, must be a subject in this because I've been so interested in light and change of light. So I decided to work over some of these not good paintings and see if I could bring them back to life by making them into nocturnal studies, um, employing things like pizza bases and mm. dinner plates as stencils and all sorts of new techniques. And the first ones were dramatic failures as always, but then the one that's on the cover was my first success. Mm. And when you have a success like that, and it's a new territory you've entered, and wow, I managed to do it. There's nothing like it, actually. It's so exciting, and you feel quite exalted. Mm. So after that, I had to do lots more. But they were all done over failures. Um, and that, again, is very satisfying if you can redeem a failure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's how the moon paintings came about. And they're getting a really interesting reception because that's the other thing. I wondered if people might think they were a bit gloomy, but I don't find the moon gloomy. I find it exciting and life-giving and very mysterious sometimes, but not gloomy. Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful change in palette. It Those is. Those lovely yes. dark blues and browns. Yeah, and exactly. Completely different colours going out on the palette and completely different interactions, especially because I've got colour underneath because I was working over the top. And that, again, is so exciting when these colours do things you don't quite expect, but better than you expect. Mm. <laughs> and some of the interactions on that painting where the, the paint kind of bubbled off the surface and then realigned itself, it's, it's so interesting and exciting. It's interesting to hear you talking about painting over uh, old, old rejected paintings, because I know an awful lot of what you, what you uh, do is very layered work, it's lots of multimedia. And I think you once said to me that you abhor the white page. Could yes. you talk a little bit about how you, how you prepare a lot of these, these fantastic paintings? Yes, um, I do. Any white surface is anathema to, anathema to me. That's a hard word to say, isn't it? Depending on the day, how I'm feeling, I will start destroying the white, usually with gesso, sometimes with splattered paint, sometimes with impressed paint, very often collage. And the secret to it is to do it in the right order, because if you do it in the wrong order, some of it can fall off. But I've learnt the <laughs> correct order by now. And I've got a little board here just to show you, because the little still lives started really with me wanting a different surface to work on and a different colour palette. So I prepared a whole lot of these boards. And that shows you there's some coloured gesso on there, there's some collage that I've pre-prepared. and. There's also a little bit of splatter. Um, and it's never the same twice. I think that's the danger. You know, if I had one set way of doing it, you would end up with a set painting each time. So 
that's why there's a, a high wasted rate, if you like, there's a lot of failures. And I've learned to live with that. And as I've explained to you quite often, they get painted over anyway, so they're not really failures. But you have to lose that worry of making mistakes. Um, and it's hard. But having done it for as long as I have, I now know that when I have a period of failures, it will come to an end mm -hmm. and I will have successes again afterwards, hopefully. <laughs> we can't escape the fact that this exhibition is happening during a very strange time uh, yes, in this indeed. country. Where did lockdown take you? I know you spoke about returning to sketchbooks from, from recent yes. travels. Yes, well, we had just got back from Sicily and no idea how dangerous that was at the time to go to Sicily, but we, we were fine, we survived it. And so I had a, a sketchbook of ideas that I'd done whilst we were there. But when we first were hit by the whole thing of being locked down and not seeing anybody, and I mean, John and I are so sociable and we absolutely adore our family, we just went into a decline, really. I think everybody did. Um, and then we got bored, so <laughs> we had to start work again. So he went off into his pottery and I went off into the studio and opened the Sicilian sketchbook and just got on with it and turned off the news because that was the main distraction for everybody, wasn't it? Mm. Um, so I listened to Radio 4 Extra instead. So there's no news, no sport. And I started on the Sicilian sketchbook and disappeared off into Sicily. And it was a lovely place to be. I just retreated there and and we just finally just got totally absorbed in our work and it was such a saving, you know, to have that to do. I don't know how, what, how other people would have occupied their time because for us it was just a gift to be able to do that. And in my case, very fruitful, mm. yes. I know you've had other places that you've enjoyed visiting. Uh, Cornwall seems to yes. be a, a popular spot. Yes, Fantastic well, we regularly go to Cornwall. We have a a sort of other life in Cornwall. We've got friends down there and our very favourite places to visit and I've got endless sketchbooks of Cornwall so they came out as well and I thought well other places I can visit I've got all these sketchbooks going back years let's get them out again so I got out the Venice sketchbook as well and using that and the Cornish one I started on a, another new idea which was the cut paper collages mm -hmm. so a little bit of a different um, discipline, which I needed, and it required a lot of concentration, which I needed to focus me away from what was happening in the real world. And a kind yes. of um, finality to them, once they've been stuck down, that's yes. it. Yes, yes, they are a real discipline. Yes, you can't start pulling things off. I did try, it makes a horrible <laughs> mess. And it was some time before I realised if I photographed them at the stage before I stuck them down, I'd have a record but no, no, it, didn't, it took some time for everyone else. <laughs> it does help. <laughs> Fine-tuned now. We have a little photographic section before I take it all to bits and then re-stick it. We've seen in the past that you have looked to paintings from, from past masters, but Bruegel mm, comes to mind. Yes. And in this exhibition, we've also got a wonderful picture after uh, Uccello's The Hunt. Yes. Could you... Talk to me a little bit about that, coming across that in the Ashmolean Museum. Yes, we had a weekend away in Oxford just looking in the galleries there and, and I just spotted it on the wall and it literally made me stop still. It was just such a beautiful painting and a long thin painting mm -hmm. and people who know my work know I do like that long thin composition. So drawn to it on all different levels, beautiful colours, beautiful design, plus it was non-religious. Um, it was a hunt scene and these chaps in tights and mini skirts running around chasing, chasing dogs and horses. Just a, a, a wonderful composition and I thought I really must have a go at doing my version of that. And to start with it, it was hopeless. I, I just couldn't, couldn't get anything to work. And then I realised it was because I was including the horses and I'm not keen on horses. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't mind dogs, <laughs> especially those lovely greyhound shaped dogs, they've got such beautiful shapes, but I couldn't, couldn't make the horses work, so I left the horses out and I thought, well, Uccello won't mind, he won't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel cheeky when I work from great masters, I do feel a bit cheeky, but it's 
all part of my practice. It's a way of absorbing their skill and their genius and trying to understand it. And, and it's sometimes very fruitful. Mm. Yes. It feels like your work has um, such a, a, a confidence in its voice. It feels this is, this is work that's been developed over a long number of years. Um, and look at some of these wonderful still life pictures over my shoulder. Uh, and they've got a completely different feel to a lot of those early ones in your career, but they're still yeah. observable yes. to yours. They're still the same objects. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's next, do you think, in your painting? Where, where is the next idea coming from? Do you know, I never know this, and that's part of the joy of it. Hopefully, when I'm allowed to get out and about a bit more <laughs> and go to more exhibitions, I will find some new inspiration. But I'm very happy with my constant inspirations as well, which are the trees and the landscape and my still lives. You know, I can go endlessly t to that source and find new inspiration. But it's never the same, never the same season with the trees, but never the same way of looking at the still lives, because I've got total control over the objects, you know. Mm. This time, they weren't even present when I did them. They were up on a shelf lurking, but I was just taking their shapes and reorganizing them according to my, my desires and placing them more with putting in the negative shapes around them hmm. than the physical shapes side by side. So that was new and different. And, and looking down on top of them, I haven't really explored that idea. I keep doing sketches and trials, so who knows? But it'll be good fun. <laughs> Jenny, thank you for talking to us today. It's been a wonderful uh, introduction to, to your work, a wonderful insight into the way that you And I would working. like to thank all of you who've worked so hard on my behalf. It's just terrific. Thank you. Thanks. So we're fortunate enough to have some of your still life objects here yes. next to the still lives themselves. Yes, I brought them in, including the tapioca tin. It's wonderful, that. <laughs> and the mustard tin that came from the back of my mum's food cupboard. <laughs> and have these been along in the collecting? Oh, I think at least 40 years, some of these have been around, yes. I can't even remember now when I, when I got them, they've just, and they've certainly been part of my children's childhood. They've all had a go at drawing them as well. <laughs> yes, and as I say, they've changed the way I've treated them over the years, although they're the same objects, completely different paintings come out of them, mm. which is why they're constantly interesting and inspirational. They're those sort of wonderful shapes that you, you can find new things in every time. Can't you? Yeah. Very little colour, really, but that, again, this palette was quite different to some of the uh, landscapes that I was doing, um, more earthy. And, in fact, I'd pre prepared the boards because I wanted a change of palette and then thought, oh, these rusty old things that I've had for years would suit that kind of colour. Um, and so rather than drawing the objects onto the board, mm. I was painting the spaces between. So probably on this one, a nice simple one, the, ba the, the background <coughs> went in to reveal the object and then the, the ground here, the little cloth. And the objects were more or less just what I had prepared as a ground. A little bit of tinkering here and there. And that's all done with oil paint, which again is one of my first loves and I, you know, I use it less than I probably ought to. So most of these have a lot of oil paint in them. And a lot of a method that I again love using, which is putting the paint on and then lifting it off, either physically with a, a painting knife or <coughs> using a piece of newspaper that I press on it mm. and it just blots the surface. Mm. Um, and then you get this lovely subtlety of these layers coming through. It's a sort of way of working that so many artists are known for, but I, I guess because you can curate your own objects, it's a very personal way of working as well. It's very much... It is, yes. Yes, and I always said if there's a house fire, um, photos of the kids and then my still life objects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lovely.
So these are your wonderful new Venetian collages, Jenny? Yes, they are. Yeah, I painted the paper myself and there's a certain amount of paint in there on the uh, grounds. Um, but they've been done from sketches, from a sketchbook from 2003. <laughs> I just had a look through, this was during lockdown when I couldn't get out and about. I thought, well, I can revisit Venice by going through my old sketchbooks mm -hmm. and selected certain certain of them that I thought would work. Some did, some didn't, but this one was one of the first ones that I was really pleased with. And it's of the domes of St. Mark's. And as I say, the sketch was used in 2003 for a completely different painting. So I've really had my money's worth out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> some lovely colours. They feel quite different actually to- Yes. To well, that's work. part of the inspiring thing of the coloured papers, because they're all over the floor. And sometimes it's just that pile of paper. You think, oh, I have to use that colour combination together. Um, rather than going by the colours, I actually used to notate my sketches in those days. Yes, I noticed, yes. Yes, they've all got little written details of colour. Yeah. I rather ignored that and just played with the colours of the papers and gave it a lovely freedom. And I like using torn edges and making the shapes quite quirky. And sometimes a shape that you've cut out on the floor the negative shape, as it were, you can reuse that somewhere else. Yeah, so lots of games to play. <laughs>So these are pictures of uh, Chicli, I think, in Sicily, where you yes. visited earlier in the year. Not a place I've been to. Before. No, it is off the beaten track. We were recommended by our landlady of the place we were staying to visit. It's not really a tourist place. We couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And just in this amazing limestone gorge, and the afternoon we visited, the sun was just cutting across it and highlighting the buildings. And I find that very exciting. Mm. I, in fact, I haven't painted buildings for a long while and didn't know if I would get excited by them, but this place really got me going. And it was just built inside the gorge, presumably for safety, um, and lovely Baroque towers coming up everywhere and winding roads and interesting rooftops. And the colours too, all these beautiful sunny yellows. There's a lovely uh, echo between the, those sort of tumbling buildings and the, and the shapes of the rocks around them. Yes. This was the main square with the trees, which weren't yet in blossom. And they formed this lovely kind of avenue leading the eye up to the... I think this was a, a monastery on the top of the hill. We didn't get up as high as that. Yes, yeah, so I did these sketches before embarking on it because I didn't really know how I was going to deal with it. So um, working the colours out on a small scale, you're always much more confident and... Amazingly, most of them did work up as bigger paintings. And it's nice to see them in a group like this. I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought of hanging them like that, but they really do work nicely, don't they? Yes. Complement one another. It's fantastic seeing these new moon paintings, Jenny, almost a sort of uh, reversal, a negative of your normal palette, those, those wonderful yeah. uh, yellows. This one's over an old painting that didn't work and actually had quite a lot of strong yellow in it, which I wanted to subdue. But the area around the moon, from my observation, there is a lot of yellow around the moon very often. So I thought, well, I'll make use of that and I actually enhanced it. But I've used a stencil technique here where that is the painting underneath mm. remaining. Um, and I've painted it up and around it with washes. Mm. and. It actually involves you being very brave, moving, mixing great bucketfuls of paint and sloshing it on, and a lot of it hoping for the best. But it does remain wet for a certain length of time, and you can drop other colours into it. So some of this warmer yellow, for example, was dropped into it. It didn't seem to be interacting sufficiently, but some of the pink was already there, and I liked that. So yeah. it's a matter of balancing um, what you've got working for you and what's not working for you and trying to balance it out and make it work as a complete thing. And I use resist techniques, which a lot of artists use them in sketchbooks and not necessarily on larger paintings. And in fact, there weren't paints that would resist up until fairly recently or I hadn't discovered them, but now I've discovered a range that will. And so you get this 
delightful surprise of the wax resist giving you light areas and texture too, picking mm. out. And then um, once it's dry enough to go vertical, then I perhaps add a few splatters and splats from a distance with a very big, full loaded brush mm. and just go for it. And the ones that don't work, I immediately lift out. <laughs> so I work by uh, taking away the mistakes at that stage. A very immediate way of It is. Painting. It's all very physical, very immediate and a lot of luck. Mm. And sometimes it dries completely differently to how you think. Other times it dries a lot better than how you think. Um, but you just have to be brave and go for it. What I love about your uh, painting is that um, the colour choices in some of these trees and, and the, the, the landscape, the woodlands, they're the kind of colours that take you by surprise when you see them in a, in a picture. But actually, if you really use your eyes, they're there. These yes. beautiful lilac uh, shades yes. here on these pinks in the, in the... Well, I think that's what our job as artists is about is, is making people see the colours that we see because mm. we see and we look and we've had years of experience but often people just assume colours mm. so to see them and make them come to life in a painting is what our job is really.